Blended Podcasts. Brought to you by Blended Audio. Welcome back and what is up everyone? This is Talos Talks Shit. I am your host, Massimo Menegeti. I've got my co-host, Pabalo Moletzi here. Yo. What's what up? it is, Pabi? What it is, son. And today, we're talking about something called GPT-2. So at the end of the last episode, uh, Pabi spoke about language between agents within OpenAI 5. How there's five members on this team, and they technically don't actually communicate with each other. So this is actually something most people don't think about, and I also didn't really think about until I started doing this podcast. But it seems to be a key area of focus for the smartest people on the planet. But basically, it's an area called natural language processing, or NLP. And um, what that is, is getting machines to understand language. So now when we think of AI, we just think of the super intelligent thing that's going to be able to communicate with us and understand our instruction and act on it. But language has it's never straightforward. There, there is both explicit and implicit meaning. There are cultural meanings. There mm. are situational meanings and contextual meanings. And language is also quite key to understanding reasoning and logic behind outcomes. And as we spoke about before, outcomes with AI aid in the future is going to be quite important because we want to be able to define clear goals and clear parameters for AI to operate with us. So OpenAI is working on this thing called GPT-2, which is Generative Pre-trained Transformer number two. Yeah. They have had a bit of an interesting timeline with this. Yep. Excuse me. So the problem with natural language processing algorithms is their ability to generate content. So we have a huge problem with fake news in the world today, and information is becoming less and less credible at large. And what OpenAI has realized is that any kind of algorithm or AI that is able to understand human language and create coherent text or coherent responses has a very large potential to be incredibly dangerous. So. They created this model that has millions and millions of parameters. And it's important to note that it's still, even with their most advanced publications on this, there's still a lot of human cherry picking of data, which means that the human authors are looking at all of the outputs and selecting the best ones to show to the public. Which means yeah. that not all output from this algorithm Which is... means it's not automated at all. Exactly. And it means it's not all good. It still messes up a lot. Yeah. Because have you actually like looked at some at some of the text? I have, yeah. It's, it's very it's like realistic, but some of it is it's, like you can tell that it's, it's like, no, it's written yeah. by yeah. So they basically they created this model and they kind of kept it secret, but in February of twenty nineteen, they released a baby version. They released the 124 million parameter model. That means the model has 124 million different parameters for understanding speech, which makes it fairly competent. And that resulted in some quite interesting publications. There was a story. So actually, sorry, let me first of all say, the key goal of this AI is to both understand text be able to answer basic questions on it and mm. to be able to summarize it and to be able to do stylistic continuation. So basically it needs to have a basic level of comprehension. It needs to be able to answer basic questions about the text. It needs to be able to summarize the text into key important points. And it needs to be able to continue the text from a couple of lines of input to generate a couple of pages of output. And with the first model, they were able to generate the story about unicorns. Oh yeah, the unicorn story. It was really interesting. Yeah. Um, so basically what they did was they fed this model a couple of lines of text. I don't know if you've got the, yeah. the, the original lines of text. But I kind of actually, like, I kind of want, just before I read it, I wanted to talk about okay. 
why this like the text that it generates just so like people appreciate the difficulty of this because like mm. what i think what people don't realize is i mean how these models work yeah and it's like unless you kind of like have like a sense of how hard it is to actually generate text you don't appreciate how amazing this is mm. so like here's an example right say i gave you i'd say i could predict with 99% accuracy what the next word you're going to say is right mm. cool which means if i have one word i can predict your next word with 99% accuracy right to predict two words ahead right it's just slightly less than 99% accuracy right because mm. it's like 99 and then 95% of that 99 goes to the next word right right now like i kind of did like a quick calculation right to predict like 100 words into the future with each word with certainty at each next word being 99% the 100th word you'll only predict with like 60 or 30 is it 36% accuracy oh yeah because like sure. the error is just like compound up right compounding right right so the f- and 100 words is like nothing it's not even like mm. a paragraph right so the idea is that like if you just knew the next word with near perfect certainty it still doesn't mean that you can it's still generate. not sufficient yeah it doesn't mean you can like and like another issue with with like neural nets is that like it's some here's like a basic example right um Miriam is a good french speaker right um therefore she probably comes from a city in france yeah right what you were able to do was go to the beginning of the sentence and figure out that french right implies that country must be france right right so you had to do two things right you had to first know the relation between french country and france and french language yeah in french language yeah but you also had to be able to figure out that the proper part of the sentence to look at was the beginning of the sentence where the word french showed up right that's the pertinent information right. so you have to like and actually this was like so that's what that's what made transformers powerful so before there were transformers there were these models called um generative language models yeah. right and what generative language models they're just normal generative without the transformer bit they just looked at the last word or the last two words or the last three words and then they generated the next word right yeah. now the issue is that is that the further back you look the more compute you need right so it was really tough for models to like look back into the past and like figure out oh what's the right word should i use miriam should i use the the yeah. to predict like and like obviously the, the and so transformers did is they came up with this really clever way of looking at the whole sentence at the same time um but yeah just just before i read it just like and then and, so then they would look at the whole sentence at the same time and then they weight information value yeah, yeah. based on what they learn through training basically yeah. so yeah. they they learn through millions and millions of bits of data of training they yeah. start learning that the fact that she is a good french speaker must imply some sort of connection with france yeah yeah so just while you pull up that sentence i'll also say that um when they released this model in february of this year people who were working on other generative language models were like what the fuck <laughs> yeah. they were like how does this happen we can barely get a coherent sentence out of the most advanced generative pre-trained yeah. model and here these guys come again with a different strategy and they producing coherent articles yeah. even though the article was cherry picked hmm. it's still amazing it's still that it, this was even one output of the, the, yeah. the algorithm so So sort of preamble before you you read out that uh, that article that it wrote is they've fed it a few bits of random information about a unicorn population that was discovered in the Chilean Andes, correct? Yeah, there's the Andes mountains. Okay. So then from that, what was the the AI able yeah. to? Yeah. So this is like what they f- so this is kind of like a uh, the petrol that they gave to the car. Like this yeah. is like the 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 initial part that the human gave right okay. in a shocking finding scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote previously unexplored valley in the andes mountain even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorn spoke perfect english okay. so this is this is what the human gave right right and now the now um gpt2 has to give the rest of the story right right 
The scientists named the population after the distinct horn over its unicorn. These four horned silver white unicorns were previously unknown to science. Now, after almost two centuries, the mystery of what sparked this odd phenomenon is finally solved. Dr. Jorge Perez, an evolutionary biologist from the University of La Paz and seven of companions, were exploring the Andes mountains when they found a small valley with no other animals or humans. Perez noticed that the valley had what appeared to be a natural fountain surrounded by two peaks of rock and a silver snow. Now, what's crazy about this already, right? Yeah, no, it, there's so many things that are crazy yeah, about this already. Yeah. But you start with what you yeah. think is crazy about this. So, the first thing is that it, it's the only information it knew about the context of where this person was, was Andes Mountains, right? That was like the pertinent part to like where the discovery was, right? Right. But it already has Jorge... Perez. So first it does. Yeah. So first it managed to create a name that sounded legitimate and yeah. was um, contextual to the region. Yeah. Then it managed to um, associate a university yeah. that was within the region and actually likely to be involved in the study. Yeah. But now let me drop a third bomb on you. If you read the article. Yeah. The structure of the article is actually almost perfect. Yeah. The way it presents information is structured almost exactly like a human. Mm, like a scientific article. paper exactly. or like an article. Exactly. Or you know, yeah. the, the way it breaks it down first, the unknown population, then the scientist, yeah. then where the scientist is from, and then yeah. the environmental factors that allowed for this. I mean, listen to this. Like this, the last like, couple of paragraphs. Dr. Perez believes that the unicorns may have originated in Argentina, where the animals were believed to be the descendants of a lost race of people who lived there before the arrivals of humans in those parts of South America. While their origins are still unclear, some believe that perhaps the creatures were created when a human and unicorn met each other in a time before human civilization. According to Perez, in South America, such incidents seem to be quite common. However, Perez pointed out that it is also likely that the only way of knowing for sure if unicorns are indeed the descendants of, lo of, a long, of a lost alien race is through DNA. But they seem to be able to communicate in English quite well, which I believe is a sign of evolution, or at the least, a change in societal organization, said the scientist. Like... <laughs> Like, it, 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 for example, it knew the fact that they can speak English, right, is a uniquely human trait. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Therefore, anomalous amongst animals. Yeah. So therefore, so, there must be a descriptor. Yeah, no, but therefore, it, it, then that's why it says it must, it, it must have been perhaps the creatures were created when a human and unicorn met each other in a time before civilization. So it understands the contextual timeline of language and civilization there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really weird, yeah. So, so again, I'm just going to remind everyone, this is the baby model. Yeah. This is the, the baby, baby model. That's 124 million parameters versus 1,558,000 parameters. So essentially an order of magnitude less yeah. parameters. Am I understanding this order of magnitude? Oh, that's just times 10. Okay. Order so of magnitude is basically like times, times 10. Times by 10, yeah. yeah. So that was fair this year. Then in May, they followed up with a 355 million release. Wasn't that special, didn't do much. But in August, they did a six month follow up with a 744 million parameter model release. And basically this increase in parameters that the model has, it just means it's more adaptable and more capable of putting out coherent output. Mm. So now, the August 4, 744 million model is the last model they ever released. And very importantly, they released that model with a open source legal agreement that allows for better inter-organizational communication and work because they came under quite a lot of criticism in Feb for not releasing the full model. They gave their reasoning about the, the worries about dangers. As you can see, if that's what the baby model did, imagine some guy in freaking Malta or Croatia 
trying yeah. to put out fake news, generate hundreds of those stories every single day. If 99 of them are coherent enough, that's fine. You know? Yeah. So there's a huge societal ethics problem involved with these language models. Um, so currently, OpenAI has released the, the sort of medium-sized model, the half-sized model, uh, with this open source legal agreement to see what happens to see what people do with it because they don't know what's going to happen. They don't yeah. know how dangerous it's going to be in the world. And they released this legal agreement as well because the AI field is inherently competitive. Mm. And that results in organizations not necessarily su being super keen on sharing their latest research and uh, latest findings, you know. So the agreement sort of makes it so that people can't use the technology for anything without disclosing their findings and so on. And it makes the... the Is the, it the, really? Well, it makes, it makes any person who licenses the software from OpenAI sign the open source agreement. And oh, that open source agreement prevents you from uh, doing a third party license. So, so you, you can't, can't just like, ever download the model online. Yeah, and you can't ever take that and just do a third party um, product with it, you know, yeah. make a, a, yeah. a Twitter bot or whatever. The only issue with me is that, like, if I think about the kind of actors that are like making fake news, it's like nation states, mm. right? And all you need to like reproduce the results is the paper. Yeah, so this is why they haven't released the full size paper yet. They don't no, know. no, the, the the research paper, right? Yeah. So they they, they, they understand that the in the, the the papers that they've released so far, it is still um, possible for people mm. to get to that point without doing their thing, but they also understand that that might take a while. You know, yeah. it's not necessarily read the paper today, have a GPT two tomorrow. There's still a bit of technical wizardry. They oh, okay, have to... so they're not like released all the implementation. Yeah, they, 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 as I've been trying to figure out how OpenAI really works and it seems like they never really say like, this is like how it works, broad picture, zoom out yeah. view, you know, but this yeah. is not exactly how the algorithm behaves. Okay. Know? So with the open source legal agreement, they've also begun some partnerships with uh, four different universities um to study what happens after this release so the first partnership is with cornell university they are going to study the human susceptibility to disinformation generated by these models so what happened with the 744 million parameter model is that they did tests on humans on its ability to stylistically continue and summarize articles and GPT-2 was able to convince humans with a 74% accuracy rate, mm. and articles written by the New York Times were only able to convince humans with an 84% accuracy rate. So it's already not that far off in terms of its ability to convince humans. Yeah. So that's what Cornell is doing. Then the Middlebury Institute in America as well, studying how GPT-2 may be misused by terrorists to create propaganda, I suppose. Um, I'm not sure what else they would, they would use it for other than direct blatant propaganda creation. Then, this is a really interesting one. The University of Oregon is developing bias analysis tools for bias within GPT-2. So GPT-2 obviously has to have training data, mm -hmm. and that training data obviously has to be written by humans. Yeah, it came from Reddit, right? Mm. So what they did is they just, I think what they did is they crawled through Reddit, they got every link that was posted on a Reddit forum, and they pulled the data from that corresponding link. Yeah, well, specifically, they went to what's called TLDR posts, which is too long, didn't read. Oh, I see. So most people on Reddit post a couple of sentences, but some people post these whole long stories, and they prioritized those because it was more... Oh, I see. More words, more data. So now, being trained on human data, humans implicitly have bias within them. We yeah. all have some sort of bias. Yeah. And already, there are AIs being used in um, basic small court proceedings. Um, 
that are showing by they're being used as like legal representatives yep. for very small legal things they're already beginning to show systematic bias against people and classes that have been targeted yeah for a very long time so it's very important that we detect and analyze and start preventing against bias yeah. within language models because we don't want to get 20 30 years down the line and we create this awesome android and it's a racist piece of shit yeah. you know <laughs> and just it's also not just G- like so gpt2 is just a family of transformer models so like in fact after gpt2 came out uh, google released a new language model called bert oh, right cool. and so it was like bidirectional autoencoder i don't know what the r stands for transformers and it outperformed GPT-2 at some, like, on on standard benchmark tasks. And then another one came out called XLNet that Microsoft released, and it was also super powerful. So there are, like, there are all these, like, transformer models that all need to be checked. Because, like, it's it's crazy. Like, I mean, I, I like, it's, like, it's kind of scary. I'm happy that OpenAI is kind of like releasing their models, but they just, like, there's a certain minimum threshold of like performance that you need for fake information. And if it means, well, I'll use a BERT model, GPT-2, or XLNet, like all these models are like, I think like similar in performance with like differences on specific benchmarks for like different tests. Right, yeah. But it's like for all of them, we, we need to check all of them for bias. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So as far as I know, no one else is checking for bias. <laughs> Yeah. really so yeah we're gonna we're really just gonna have to see they really like i said they released this this follow-up in august this year and they're essentially in the same boat as the rest of the world in that they're mm-hmm. waiting and seeing what's going to happen and then finally just before we go the university of texas is detecting uh, well researching how to detect outputs from gpt2 because it's similar to generative adversarial networks mm-hmm in that each time the algorithm to check the text gets better, there's a possibility that the algorithm to create the text Mm. may be better through adversarial play. And um, currently, I think we only have a 90% accuracy rate in detecting outputs of GPT-2. Oh, like if I if you gave me a random script, but I yeah. know it came no, no, no. If you gave an algorithm a random script, they're creating I algorithms see. to identify I see. Things, things created by GPT-2, and they currently only have a ninety percent accuracy rate. It's a similar situation with deep fakes. Exactly, exactly. It's yeah. it's the deep fakes of text. Yeah, you know. So yeah, that is a very quick rundown of GPT-2. Yeah. Um, we're going to see what happens in the coming months. And I'm sure we're going to revisit this very yeah. soon. But also, I mean, I mean, there's a, I think his name is Greg Brockman. Mm. Yeah. And he, I mean, he's like a big skeptic, but he, like he points out that um, as much as these algorithms are groundbreaking and changing, they're like things, they're basic things that they can't do. So for example, they might, it might be possible for them to write like a one page, one article fake news story. But with, with the same problem of the 99% ends up in 36% after like 100 words, the longer the articles and the more intricate they are and the more precise information that you need, the more difficult it is for these al- like for these algorithms to like actually reproduce it. So it's like, I'm always like torn between having like a realistic view of what these algorithms can like actually right, do, yeah. but also being like, they can do much more than we thought that they could do. Mm. And that's the reason to be worried. Mm. It's, like it's this constant dichotomy of they're doing more than we expect, but they're also doing less yeah. than we expect. This is like, quote, what did it, the quote was like, technology is always um, overestimated in the short term and underestimated in the long yeah. term. Yeah, that is very true, dear. Yeah. But I'm going to throw one more thing at you and I'll listen to this before we go. So GPT-2 is actually now a published author. Really? Yeah, you can go into Amazon and download or buy a paperback version of a book written by GPT. It wrote a whole book. It wrote a whole book, but it was edited by a human. I see. So it was edited by a guy called Sigal Samuel. And it is a book about... Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I m- messed that up. Um, there was a full novel by a guy called R.M. Gonzalez. He was a sci-fi author. 
Um, Sigal Samuel used GPT-2 as a writing aid. So he was writing a sci-fi book, and whenever he hit writer's block, he'd put a sentence into GPT-2 Yo, that is hilarious. and see what came out, and then use the output creatively within his thing. You that know? is so wild. So it, was, it worked really, really well for him. And then another author, R.M. Gonzalez, thought, let me try write a whole book about this. And I'm really um, sorry I can't remember the name of the book now, but it's a book about metamorphosis, a sci-fi about metamorphosis. Like when you like a dude turns into a cat or something. No, like when a caterpillar turns into a butterfly or whatever. Okay. But from like the caterpillar's perspective, I see. Super esoteric, super trippy, pretty detached from reality, but still a really convincing read. I read the first like five pages, and it's like really enjoyable. Some places the language falls short, and I think he left it like that intentionally just okay. to show the uh, the holes within the AI. But. Yeah, it uh, very recently is now a published author and uh, there's not much info on that at the moment. So it's one of those things we're just going to have to wait and see how it mm. develops. That's pretty wild. Uh, yeah. What are you doing with your life, Masi? Any published papers? Uh, <laughs> I got zero. <laughs> I got zero. Nope, nope, nope. nope. Uh, published podcasts. Yeah, dope. Published podcasts. <laughs> But anyway, thank you very much for listening, everyone. Thank you, Pubby, for the chat. Right. Thank you, Blended Podcasts, for allowing us to do this. Please check us out at Blended Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. And like and share with your friends. Cheers, guys.